In this video, we're going to take a look at some CompTIA ITF Plus test preparation best practices. A lot of teachers have asked, what are the best ways to approach getting our students ready for this very rigorous exam? So hopefully this video will help you understand what you're up against, and let's get started. All right. So many of you all know this, but I'm going to go over it anyway. The uh, CompTIA IT, ITF Plus exam is going to have anywhere from 70 to 75 questions on it. Okay. Now, of course, you, every student will get a different test because the questions are randomly chosen when the student starts the test. But they'll get about 70 to 75 questions. 75 is the limit. Right? Now, it is a time test, so you, the student has to be very aware of their time. There will be another video talking about day, test day strategy, so look out for that one. But they're going to get 60 minutes to, to take this exam. There will be a clock steadily uh, timing and clicking away at your time. So 60 minutes is the exam time. Uh, it features only multiple choice questions, but there are two types of multiple choice questions. One is will be a single answer, and another type will be a multi-answer question. So a student has to be ready for that, right? Some questions will be just choose one, and some will choose two or three, okay? Let's talk about the score. Now, the score for a CompTIA test uh, is very weird. It's a strange system. Um, so for this particular exam, the passing score is a 650, a 650, okay? So what does a 650 mean? A 650 means um, that anything above it is a pass, right? But exactly what does that mean? It was very hard to judge um, for a couple of reasons. One is the um, some of the questions uh, on the ITF exam will be test uh, 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 will be experimental questions that aren't going to be graded. And some questions are experimental, but they are graded. So the number of questions you get based on, you know, how some are weighted differently, if they're multiple choice, multiple selection, um, will dictate how your score is is produced. So it's kind of a really strange system. Nobody really knows how it's, uh, or I'm sure CompTIA knows, but most of us don't know how the score is being generated. And it's best not to worry about it too much, right? Um, what is a, a good strategy is to know that if you compare the CompTIA test to a regular just high school test or college test, it's around about an 85 score on a on a 100% question test, right? So when you start practice testing, getting ready for this test, in your mind or, or your students' minds, they should be thinking about scoring 85s or higher on practices. So I know many of you are going to go, 85s? I mean, we barely get these kids to make 70s. Yeah, I know. And that's that's just the nature of this beast, right? CompTIA exams are rigorous. They are not designed for high school kids or or, or even college students. It's They're designed for anybody who wants to get certified, regardless of age. And because of that, you have to be ready for the rigor. And the students need to be practicing and getting scores on practice tests in, in the higher scores. So 85s are really what you're shooting for. 90s are even better, OK? All right. Again, what's really important at this phase, if we're talking about test preparation, is that the students must be really aware that they're entering a whole new phase of, the, of your class, right? So your class should be broken up into two phases. Phase one was the beginning of the year, where you were telling the students or, or teaching the students about the curriculum, um, teaching them about different topics and all of the fun stuff, right? Doing labs that you uh, will help enforce, reinforce that knowledge. But that part of the class at this point should be is over, and you're entering in a whole new phase. This is the test preparation phase. So I really recommend you explaining that to the students. We are no longer really in phase one. We're in phase two of total immersion of test preparation, right? Without true immersion in test preparation, um, uh, successfully passing this test is difficult, okay? So we kind of recommend that you schedule about four to eight weeks of test prep, okay? Um, they should be test these students should be practice testing at least five to 10 hours a week, right? 40 hours total, right? Some may need more, some may need less, but could, again, it tends, depends on the, on the student. But this is just kind of like a generic guideline, right? Now, Again, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I've been teaching for 18 years. The high school was at 
I taught for 12 years and I was able to become very successful in getting my students to pass these CompTIA exams. And a couple of strategies you might want to think about is, of course, the student needs to practice on their own. There's no way to get around it. They need to go and just immerse themselves in this, uh, just themselves testing each student being individual. But sometimes it's nice to group them together and do some group test uh, 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 strategies. So a couple of things I, I used to do was I used to pair the students up into small groups, maybe two or three students around a computer, and have them take a practice test together, right? Everything from taking the test to going through all the explanations and even reviewing this topic. So that's not a bad idea. They help each other out. But of course, that's not, and you shouldn't be doing it all the time because one of the students will be more, will be stronger and the other students will just watch the other student take the test. So it has to be really managed well. Another good thing that I, another thing you can do is which is something I did was I would put a test on a, a projector screen. I, I, you know, I, I was very lucky at the school district I had, we had projector screens and we would go through a test with the entire class, going through the exam, then going through the reviews and going through the, uh, the topics that we, you know, the students were finding to be difficult. So that's another way to do a group testing. I like it. Um, for me personally, I, we did it not every day. We did it like one day a week or and I would team them up one day a week and the rest of the time they were doing individual testing. So again, uh, it's just another way for the students to break up their week because they're going to get tired of practice testing. Uh, another thing is students should be practice testing at home. I know this is going to be difficult because they have other classes and their focus isn't just on your class. But if you can convince them in some way, and this is what I used to do it, right? I used to tell my students, hey, you're, we're in high school. We're in junior high, right? This test was, was designed for adults, right? They don't think you can pass this test. They think you're not mature enough. They don't think you're smart enough. They don't think you're capable. Let's prove them wrong, right? And how are we going to do this? We are going to all band together and let's get this, this taken because be successful on this exam. So that's how you kind of accomplish that. Goal. That's what I used to do. I used to just make it kind of a, a, a challenge, right? They don't think you can do it, right? It's always, you know, you need a foe, right? Everybody needs a foe. All right. So as you all know that the CompTIA uh, exams are all written around objectives, right? And they have different numbers of objectives. Like CompTIA writes many tests. There's the Network Plus, the A Plus, Security Plus, all their plus tests, right? This is the uh, IT Fundamentals Plus, right? And they're all built on a certain amount of questions on their exam. So as you can see here, right, this exam um, is got six objectives, right? And they are the number of questions you'll get in the test are certain percentages. So the highest percentage is right here, right? The infrastructure, right? So again, if this was a 100 question test, if it, if it was, it's not, it's 75, but if it was, you'd get 22 questions on infrastructure, right? You would get 20 questions on security. You would get 17 questions on IT concepts and terminology. You get the picture, right? If it was a 100 question test, that's how many you would get. Well, it's not a 100 question test. It's a 75 or maybe even 70 question test. But the percentages are still going to be the same. You're going to get, you know, 20, 22% of the test will be on infrastructure, okay? Well, knowing this, it's just help, this will help us to strategize how to take our practice test. So let's take a look at um, our strategy. So one of the best tools that you have at, for t from the test out software is our 20 question domain practice test. This is where you should start, right? Do not just start diving into 75 question practice tests. Don't, don't do that. What you really want to do is start with the 20 question uh, exams that we have in test out. And that's where you're going to start. And you want to start with the one that has the highest percentage. So we suggest that you start with infrastructure first. Okay, infrastructure first. And then that's going to be test B 2.2, then move to security, and then obviously move to application, terminology, development, and then fundamentals, right? Or database fundamentals, right? So this is the order you should be starting at. Start with the B 2.2 test and then move from there to the, the objectives that have less and less um, percentages, okay? So um, what we really ramped up um, the, the tools that are inside these tests. And we'll take a look at them in a few seconds, okay? So this is where you start, the 20 question domains. Now, every time they take a domain test, it's going to generate a new test. That's what makes it so cool with these 20 question tests, right? So they take the, question, the test once, it generates 20 questions, they take it, they're graded, they go and review, and they do it again. It's, you know, it's kind of like wash and, wash and rinse, wash and rinse, right? 
The goal is to get consistent 85s on these tests. Now, you have to be careful because the students will start memorizing questions. And we've written a lot of new questions. We have over 700 new uh, questions that are on these on the uh, ITF, uh, ITF um, Test Out a Pro um, course. But, uh, you know, but, so what you're looking for is the students to get 85s on these tests. Once, once they start getting 85s on the first, the 22% infrastructure domain, then move to the next domain, right? When they're getting 85s consistently, move to the next domain, right? Don't go to take this test first and then you get to go to the next one. No, stay with one, master it, go to the next, master it, go to the next, master it, right? Once you've mastered all of them, then we'll start looking at the full-blown practice test. We'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Awesome. Okay, so let's go to the next slide here. Uh, if I can get my mouse over there. Okay. Okay, so as students finish each domain exam practice, in a practice session, use the exam report to go over the questions they missed. Okay, so they're going to get a report, right? You're going to report. And what's really cool about the new reports is it gives you links um, to, um, t uh, to resources within test out so you can review it. So that's very cool. So the student can take the exam, score themselves, and then go and when they look at the review, the score review, they'll see that there are links to go and study the things that they need help with, right? So use the explanations, explanations to learn more about why they struggled with these questions. Use the reference link to review study associated material. I just said that, right? I'm just reading off the slide now. And make sure the student is not memorizing these questions, right? Try to keep them from memorizing them, right? You know, these the questions on our exams are not going to be on the real test. So there's no reason to memorize them, right? They're not on the real test. What they want to do is use them to give them an idea of what, what they're, they're needing to review and then use the resources with the links to go and review. And I'll, we're going to go over that in a few seconds, so it's all good. Okay. Okay, so here's something that's also extremely important. On the actual CompTIA exam, now I'm going to create a video talking about the actual exam and test day and how to prepare for that that day, the day you take the exam. So we'll, we'll have another video for that. But as many of you have taken a CompTIA exams, you know that there's the ability to flag questions, right? So there's a strategy of how to flag questions. Again, see the next video and you'll, I'll go over that, right? But this is a skill that a student, the student must practice. They must practice flagging and practice some strategies for flagging, right? So uh, I'm going to go over that in a few minutes, but just know that this is really important. Don't don't save this skill like the day before the test, or don't or, or don't even, and don't cover it. Or, and make sure you, you do cover it. Don't forget to cover it because the student needs to practice the skill, right? Because of a, because the test is time, or the, because the time limit, so you spend enough time on questions that they feel comfortable with first. So there's again there's some strategies, right? So w when you get into the real test, right, you have a timer clicking away. You have 75 questions possibly to answer. And what you want to do is use your time wisely, right? So as you go through the tests, you want to kind of go for the low-hanging fruit, right? So if you get a question that you can answer right away, you'll know it. I, I can answer it. Answer it quickly and move on, right? The key to this, the, the actual test, is to acquire more time. You want to acquire time for the harder questions, right? Because with a 60 question, I mean, with a 75 question test and 60 minutes to, to go through it, you get less than a minute per question. And I know what you're thinking, man, less than a minute per question. Some of these questions are hard, right? Well, what you want to do is answer the easy questions quickly, and that way you're gaining or acquiring more time for the harder questions. Okay, so you want to get through it in that kind of that strategy, right? And if you if a student sees a question that they don't know the answer not answered right away, they're going to want to flag it and save it for later. Save the hard questions for later. Now, if they guess, they also want to flag. So if they're like, I don't know, but I'm going to guess, flag it, right? So, right, and anything else they want to just like save for later, flag it, right? They need it to do that. Now, there's another strategy I'm going to talk about when we get to an example, and I'll show you that in a few seconds, that you're going to want to document some way what you're flagging. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes, right? So again, make sure you're testing, you're taking those 20 question domain review quizzes first, the B.2s, right? And and uh, and so and, and allow the students to practice that that flagging skill. You can only flag in the 20 question practice test. We haven't developed a flag in the full blown test yet. Now we I think we are working on it, but for right now, the only way to practice flagging is in the 20 question domain tests, not the actual test. Okay, so here we go. So let's take a look at um, the 20 question exam. So here we go. 
So I'm in labs uh, test out here, right? And I'm going to go ahead and go to our area where we have a practice exams. They're down here, right? And when, under the B, CompTIA practice exams. And if you notice, there's some documents here that you can read about objectives and strategies. But what I'm looking at here is our 20 question domain questions. No, and again, like I said, when you start a, a new ex, a, 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 a exam, it generates a random set of 20 questions, which is really cool, right? So, so um, I'm going to start one of these tests. I'm going to go with just uh, actually the one that is the most, it's the 22% is the infrastructure. So I'm going to start that one. So I'm just going to click on it, right? It gives you the, uh, there's no time limit on our 20 uh, question domain uh, quest, uh, uh, test. Now, if you wanted to set domain, uh, time limits, you could create your own 20 question domain uh, 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 custom exams and set different times on them if you wanted to. But there's no reason for these tests, I think, in my opinion. Now, that is a strategy for the 75 question exams. Now, uh, our, our, 20, uh, our full 75 question exams have a 60 minute timer built into them. And you can't change it on our exams. But the way to get around that is to create 75 question custom exams and set the time to whatever you want. So a lot of teachers have asked for that. They said, hey, how come, how come I can't change the time on, the, on your full-blown 75 question exams? Well, because we're trying to, trying to simulate that real test environment where you can't manipulate the time and you have to get used to that time. But if you want to extend time, just create a custom exam and give it more time. Okay. So let's take a look at the exam real quick. Okay. So I'm just going to restart it. So now it's going to generate a new, a new set of 20 questions. I actually took it before and I'm generating a new one. I don't know any of these questions, right? And so if you notice a couple things, the next button right here, your choices, right? Now, here we go. Mark this question for review. On the real test, it's just called flag question, right? But this is what I want to show y'all is the flagging mechanism, right? So let's just pretend I don't know this question. So I'm going to flag it. Okay, and maybe it's too long. Maybe it's a really long question. I want to save it for later, or I just don't know it. I'm going to flag it, or maybe I'm guessing. I'm going to flag it. Okay, let's go to the next question. Okay, well, I'm just going to choose some answers here just for fun because I'm, I don't have time to read. I'm going to hurry through this. Here's a long one. Definitely going to flag this one. Right, I'm going to just mark it for later. Okay. Um, let's see. Which of following is valid email address? Let me see. This is a valid email address right there. So I'll answer that one there. Um, which is uh, which is following is a true ADSL um, speed. Uh, let's see, uh, as, as asymmetric. Uh, I'll just use that one. I, I'm just reading these so quickly. Um, uh, I'm just going to guess one here. I'm going to mark it for later, right? I'm just going to go through these real quick, and I'm going to mark some for later. Just keep on going. I'm going to go through this real quick because I don't want to spend too much time on this. So hold on tight, everybody. I am, now here we go. Square buttons. Uh, real quick a reference. Um, if you see square buttons, it means it'll be a multiple selection. I'm going to talk about this more on the video when I talk about the day, uh, test day. But remember that it's important that you know that that you have, uh, like for instance, this is a round button, which means you only choose one. The choose multiple will be square buttons. I know most of y'all know this, but I'm just going over it real quick. I'm going to you know, mark this one for later. I'm going to keep on going. I'm just going to choose some real quick. I'm, again, I, I'm going to be wrong, but hold on tight. I just want to get through the the, this test as fast as possible. So I'm just going to choose a few. Of course, you can always check your answer anytime. So uh, what kind of connector is pictured here? This is a USB, so I can always check my answer, which is very cool, right? Uh, but you can also reference, uh, look at it later in the review. So here we go. I'm going to just keep on going. Uh, persistent RAM, memory chips are stored. Uh, those are um, percent flash, very good. Check answer. I just happen to be right. Thank you very much. I hope so. Uh, I'm just going to choose one of that reading here. Mark it for later. Where am I at? 16. Almost there. Keep on going. Let's mark another one here. Ooh, there's a lot of them. There's a long one. I'm going to save it for later. Boom. Next. Uh, SSD. Uh, my best performance. SSD. PCI, I guess. Oh, SATA. There we go. I'm just, I'm, I already, I'm not even reading the question. Right? I got, well, and but not two. I should have guessed. All right. So let's keep on going. Almost there, flag for later. Okay, here we go. So now I'm at the end of this quiz, right? And um, I hit next, and I'm going to get two choices. One is review and a score exam. Now the students, if, they've, if they're practicing this flagging technique, they're going to want to go to review. Did you all hear that? If they're practicing the flagging technique, they need to hit the review button. They'll hit score because then it's just going to score their exam. I want them to get the feel for the real test, and that is always to hit, that would be like the review button. Okay, now if you notice, 
we have this little question, this little question um, here with a little arrow, and this is going to give me all the questions that I flag. Notice how it's not in order, right? It was one, the seven, there is nine, fifteen. These are the questions I flagged, and now I can look at them again and decide either to change my answer, which is not usually a good idea. Usually your gut is right, but I'm not reading these questions, so I don't know. And I can always check my answer here. Well, I happen to be right on that one. I, I think I just guessed or even just chose one, and I just got lucky on that one. But again, it gives you the explanation. Very important that they read an explanation, right? And then they go through the, and you can also show all of them if you wanted to. So if you say show all of them, it'll just show everything in order, 16, 17, right? So if I go back to this one, I take this away. Now I'm just going to see the ones I'm flagging. Does that make sense? So show all, we'll show you all the questions. Show the ones you flagged are going to be the ones, only ones you flagged. Does that make sense, everybody? Hope so. Okay. So very cool. Only ones I flagged. So let's go ahead and score this exam. Okay, so let it score. I failed probably because I didn't uh, answer all of them. And it's only 20, so there's a lot of points involved, right? So there we go. So what's really cool now with the new release of the, of the IITF course is if you click on one of the questions, right, it shows you what the, real an the answer was. It gives you an explanation of why that answer is that way. But it gives you links to... Um, to part the, the parts of the course to explain that question. So like I want to talk about SDRAM. So I hit this this here and it takes me right to the video. I'm not leaving the test environment. Isn't that fantastic? So now I can go in and watch this video and it talks about the test environment and talks about the, the how to you know that question. Okay? Isn't that fantastic? We also do it for the fact sheets. Again, you're not leaving the test environment. It all stays there within that environment. And I think that's really, really helpful, right? If I go and I can go to each one, like for instance, I got this one incorrect. It gives me my explanation and resources of how I can practice or do something to reinforce this topic. So again, this is all part of the new version, and I think it's just really fantastic. A lot of my students, when I was a teacher at home, used to ask me, Mr. C, I wish I could have a review, and it would take me to the, and I go, yeah, someday, and someday has come. Isn't that fantastic? Okay. So that is how you take the 20 uh, question domains. And again, what we're shooting for is 85s consistently. I would say three in a row. I would say that. Once they get three in a row, move on to the next objective. So they can go on to the next one. This would be, uh, again, I'm not going in order. I'm starting with, with the ones that 22%, 20% in, in that way to follow the objectives. Once they're done with that, then we can start looking at, we can start looking at the full-blown exam. Okay. So now we're at the full practice test tips, right? So here we go. To take the full test as practice test, again, is the students need to get used to that 60-minute hot seat. They need to know that they have 60 minutes to take this test, and they need to be totally aware of their time, right? Now, the only thing about the, this, our full practice is you can't flag yet. I think they're working on getting that in, incorporated right now. But for right now, you can't flag, so that's unfortunate. On the real test, you're going to have test strategies. Watch my next video for that, right? And, but what's cool about it is you still get a exam a review, right? And you can go and see what questions you missed and go review. And we still give links to, to materials that they can review for the questions they missed and explanations of all the, all the questions. So again, it's, it's important not to do this until they're finished with all the, the domain, the 20 question domain tests. You're starting with the domain tests. Make sure they're very fluid. Make sure they're getting 85s on all those domain, all six domain tests and then move to the final exam. Now, if they're not scoring very high on the final exam, then they need to go back to the domains and do it all over again, or not all over again, but do those again, right? The ones that they're, the domains that they're having problems with. So again, they have to be very conscious, right? They did the domains, they feel pretty good about it, they move to the full, they're not doing very good, go back to the domains, okay? Very cool. Oh, and don't forget, you can't, uh, you can't change the timer on this, so if you want a a, a, a different timer, maybe some more time for some of your kids that need it, then you can always do a custom exam. Just choose some questions from our test banks and give it more time. Okay. Another thing about this test is they are there are some skills-based questions that you need to be aware of. I'm sure you are, but just I'm trying to make you more aware of it. And they're going to require that the student do something, or calculate something, or know how to read something and, and, and know the output out of that. So examples of that would be like binary conversions, right? They're going to ask you to convert a binary number to decimal, a decimal number to binary. They're going to ask you to convert a hexadecimal number to binary or binary to hex. 
So I'll make sure the kids get plenty of practice on those skills, right? Um, we are going to send out a document and, and have it posted on our, on, our, on our site so that you can download a site that gives you some links to some ways to practice these skills, some websites to give you practice. So look out for that, for that, that, uh, that document. It's a document that really explains a lot of this in even more detail. Another thing is they need to be able to um, practice the skill where they're converting the numbers, right? So binary conversion, decimal conversion to binary, hexadecimal, um, computer storage conversion, gigabytes to terabytes or whatever. Uh, they also need to be able to read pseudocode. So this is important. So practice this skill. There's a lot of websites I'm talking about pseudocode other than our test out uh, uh, course. So again, sometimes hearing it from different ways is very important. I mean, we I think we do a really good job of, 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 of explaining these topics and our fact sheets are so important. Oh my God, the fact sheets. But don't be afraid to go out. I'm, not, I'm sure you're not to go out to other resources. You know, there's a bunch of them out there. And then JavaScript, being able to read JavaScript. So the students need to practice these skills way before the actual test so they'll be ready for that okay so another thing is that's super important is understanding uh the comptia questions right so some of you have probably taken the comptia exam the iitf already the plus maybe you haven't taken it but for those of you who have you you've probably experienced the questions and and I've been doing this for a long time. I've been, again, 18 years as a teacher doing certifications in different aspects of Linux and, and the Cisco certifications and the CompTIA certifications. And I can tell you the CompTIA certification, the, the questions are fallen to a couple of buckets. One, they're poorly written, right? They're not written very well. The Whoever is doing the editing is not really doing a good job of, uh, of, of editing these to be uh, fluid English type questions, right? Another thing is they um, they are they can be very um, uh, hard to understand what they're asking for, right? They can be uh, not, uh, and we're going to go through some examples, right? So they can be hard to understand. What are you exactly? What are you asking for? Uh, there's also the skill based questions where they're asking you to do some math or some conversion or looking at some code and knowing what it's about to do, right? So so this is important, right? So let me read this, right? It is critical for students to understand that the IT, IITF exam does not ask many high-level conceptual questions. In other words, you're not going to get that, what does uh, IoT stand for? Don't you wish you could get those questions? What is I, you know, Internet of Things? Or what is the main advantage of cloud computing? You're not going to get those kind of simple questions. They are, they're new, the new test, now that used to be the old test, but the new test is more like very, it's, it's designed to be confusing and, and, they're, and, and, and throw you off, right? Now, I know people are saying, why do they do that? It's just the nature of CompTIA, the beast, right? They just, that's their test, and we are playing in their playground, and we just have to know that that's what they do, and we have to get ready for that, right? Most questions for the students encounter require much deeper understanding. For many test uh, items, students need to analyze the question scenario to answer the question correctly, right? So again, they need to read the full question. I used to tell my students um, to put your finger on the screen and read the question uh, with your finger on the screen. That way you read the, the whole question because a lot of times uh, I'm famous for this. I see the first part of the question. I think, oh, I know the answer to this question already. But then later on, there's a not statement, which is not the right answer. So they threw that curveball at you, right? So it's important to read the entire question, right? Again, some questions uh, uh, require a task, right? Some type of task. So they're going to have to do some math, right? We're going to talk about those strategies on the next video. Again, and some questions are ambiguous and confusing. Uh, I like these are these are nice words for it, right? I have other words for it that I can't say in this video, right? But it's true. The CompTIA questions are ambiguous. They're like, what are they asking for? They're confusing and like knots and double negatives, right? So let's take a look at some questions and the, the examples that you'll see on the exam, real quick. Let me get there real quick. Okay. So here's an example of a scenario-based question, right? Some type of scenario that is being created. In response to a user's input, a web application needs to make changes to the content of a table in a database. What general program language do you use to accomplish this task, right? So again, this is a very high level question because they're not asking you to find something, right? So let me read the explanation, right? In addition to understanding what SQL language categories are, so you have to know what these acronyms, what they actually are, what is included in these languages, right? They must know common SQL actions associated with DML, what a web application is, and what user's input means in the context of the question, right? In other words, you've got to know specifics about four different, three different things. What's an application? What's a database? What are these languages, right? 
it's not just like what port is HTTP, port 80, right? I wish it was that way, but it's not going to be that way. So that, again, requires a little bit deeper understanding. And that's what the students are up against, right? Let's take a look at another question. Here's another scenario-based question. Sam works from home. His wireless network generated poor signal quality. The signal improved when an old cell cordless phone stopped working. What pro problem did the cordless phone cause when it was active? Okay, so here we go. There's the scenario. So the student has to know, well, what are cordless phones? <laughs> what is a cordless phone, right? We're not talking about cell phones. We're talking about cordless phones, and most people don't even have one anymore. And what is that What is that device doing to cause that could cause havoc with Wi-Fi, right? And they have to understand the signaling of Wi-Fi and how it works, right? So again, right, they have to know what a, uh, how a cordless phone affects the quality of wireless and what that phenomenon is called, interference, right? So again, these are a deeper understanding type question that CompTIA is trying to is throwing at y'all. Here's the skill-based question. Again, skills, right? Convert 40 a binary to a 40 decimal to binary. Again, this just takes practice, like math. Right? Math is a skill. You practice long enough, you'll get good at it. Just make sure the kids can do these going from decimal to binary, binary to decimal, hex to decimal, I mean, not, hex, hex to binary, binary to hex. Do not cover hex to decimal if, if you don't want to. It's not on the test, and it's, it's, it's not that easy. So, um, But anyway, if, unless you really want to do it and the kids are, you feel the kids can handle it. Anyway, but again, this needs, just takes practice. And the last one is, um, oh, this should say ambiguous. It says skills. That's incorrect. I messed that up. This is an ambiguous or confusing question. I apologize. This is incorrect right here. This should say ambiguous or confusing. So here we go. I po apologize for that, that place. A company operates uh, two offices in the same town with 100 employees at each building. What type of network does it need to connect all its employees? A LAN or a WAN? Okay. Well, the correct answer is WAN because of multiple locations. But here's the problem with this question, right? They're not giving you a distance to the offices. What happens if the offices are just across the street from each other? What happens if they're on a campus where they're close to each other? They're not giving you more, enough information, really, in my opinion, to make, this, to make a good choice on this. Because I have worked on networks for 28 years, and I have set up lands with multiple buildings that are within a reasonable distance from each other, and we didn't require a WAN provider to make those connections, but they are in different buildings, in different locations, in the campus or in a, in a city block. So this question is ambiguous or confusing because it doesn't give you enough information to make a good choice. And that's why some students will get confusing, like, well, are they close together? Or are they far? And again, some students will just pick on the go, well, it must be a WAN because it's different locations. But again, for the really, really, usually students who are really into this, they'll know that something is not right with this question and it becomes ambiguous. Okay? So that's uh, ambiguous. And I apologize for this being not saying, it should say ambiguous or confusing up there. Okay? All right. All right, so let's go ahead and end this video. In conclusion, again, it's important for students to understand the ITF exam does not ask many easier, high-level conceptual questions. Don't you wish? It's not, right? It's not going to ask you, um, what does Wi-Fi stand for, right? Wireless interface, you know, anyway, I can't answer that question, but they are not going to ask you something easy, right? Students must be, have a solid and deep understanding of the material. Superficial knowledge will not be enough to be successful on this exam. That's, guy. I'm afraid this is true, right? We wish it was something that the students could just kind of learn in a couple of months and just, you know, go take the test and pass. And the initial version was this way, but I'm afraid those days are over, okay? If a student does not have a strong knowledge base of the material, answering scenario-based skill or ambiguous questions will be very difficult. That is so true, right? That is true because... That's what they're up against, right? These ambiguous, confusing, skill-based questions, right? Practice test, then review, practice test, then review, practice test, and over and over. Guys, I'm afraid this is the key to passing this test. You cannot over-practice test. This is not, you can't do that, right? Unless you start memorizing questions, then it becomes defeative. But again, you need to practice test, review, know what you, why you got that question wrong, and then rinse and cycle, rinse and wash, rinse and wash over and over and over, right? The student will not like this very much. I can tell you that. I know. I was, I was a high school teacher and I taught uh, freshmen to seniors. I even was involved with some junior high 
classes for Cyber Patriot when I was doing Cyber Patriot, teaching uh, junior high kids. And they don't like this idea of having to review and practice over and over. But that's just the nature of the beast. So you can try to motivate them with the idea of that, you know, this is a test that was written for adults. We're going to show them that we can do this. We're smart enough. We're, we're capable of doing this. And they totally are. I had junior high kids pass Network Plus before. I had high school kids pass Network Plus and this exam, ITF. Um, so it is totally possible for them to do this. But it takes a lot of work. It takes some decent strategies that you have to convey to the students. This is what they're up against. It's not going to be pretty, but we can do this together. And team them up. Get them that reinforcement. Pump them full of positive why this is an important exam. It is an important exam if they want to get into IT. This is the gatekeeper first exam they're going to use to get into other more comp more complex um, concepts, more uh, more uh, exciting uh, subject matter like security and, and deeper security understanding, deeper network understanding. So really make sure the kids say this is just your vocabulary. We're teaching you vocabulary so that you can go on and do crazy cool things and really uh, have a career in something that is exciting. I know I've been in this field for 28 years in IT. My background is in engineering, but I've been in, 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 in infrastructure. I've been in IT for quite a while. And I have said I have I've had spent 28 years, even when I was a teacher at high school, I have spent 28 years loving this IT field in every capacity, whether it's working as a as an admin, working as a developer, and working as a teacher. I have enjoyed it so much. And if you convey that passion to the students and how exciting this field is, then just it's just going to take work and that's just part of it. They will succeed. I promise you they will. So anyway, so good luck and you can do this. So, all right, good luck.